verse 23. I'm going to read the verse and you'll get the points of my message. Of this man's seed hath God according to his promise raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. The Savior God raised. The greatest need that I have and the greatest need that you have as well is a Savior. I need to be saved from myself. You know, one of my most frequent prayers is, Lord, save me from myself. I'm more afraid of myself than anything else. I need to be saved from my sins. I need to be saved from the wrath of God. I need a Savior that is able to save me without my works. That's what I need. If anything is required of me to do before I can be saved, I will not be saved. I'm dead sure of that. Of this man's seed, now this is speaking of David. His name means the beloved. Oh, how God loved David. How God loved the greater David. How God loves the greater David. Truly, he is the beloved of the Father. I love the way he says to us, this is my beloved Son, hear ye him. He is our beloved. Of this man's seed, the son of David. Paul opens up his epistle to the Romans by telling us that the Lord Jesus Christ was declared to be or made of the seed of David according to the flesh. This is according to God's promise. And declared to be the son of God with power. I think of the two blind men. Thou son of David. Have mercy on us. When he would cast out a demon. The crowd said is not this the son of David. It's got to be. The Syrophoenician woman cried out. Have mercy upon me. O Lord, thou son of David. Bartimaeus, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Now look back up in verse 22. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David, the beloved, to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony, isn't it something that God gives us testimony? I'm so thankful for that. Didn't have to, but he does. And what is his testimony? I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Now David is called the man after God's own heart, but Christ is God's own heart. Jesus Christ is the heart of God. Now God's heart, God is a person. That's simple enough, isn't it? God is a person with a mind, an intellect, affections, a will, 
He's the mind of God, so much so that he's called the word of God. When God speaks, what's the word that comes out? This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. All of God's love is in his son. The father loveth the son and hath given all things into his hands. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He's the will of God. You want to know the will of God? Christ Jesus is the will of God. He said, I delight to do thy will, O God. Yea, thy law is written in my heart. He said, my meat and my drink is to do the will of him that sent me and finish his work. He said, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. He's the will of God. Of this man's seed hath God, hath God raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. Now listen to this statement very carefully. Salvation is what God does, period. Salvation is of the Lord. If you and I are saved, it'll be because he saved us. You know, there's something that annoys me as much as anything is when somebody says, I got saved. I got saved. You don't speak like that when the Lord saves you. You say, the Lord saved me. That's your experience. You don't say, I got saved. You say, the Lord saved me. Somebody says, you're picking, you're, you're splitting hairs. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. That is speaking of an ignorance of salvation in the first place. How he is salvation. If you're saved... The Lord saved you. Don't you know that's so? 2 Timothy 1.9 says, He saved us. That's everything we believe, isn't it? He saved us. And He called us with a holy calling. This is so important. What came first, the saving or the calling? The saving. The saving took place before the calling, before our experience of anything. He Saved us. Salvation is of the Lord. We're saved because God the Father chose us to be saved if we're saved. We're saved because God the Son redeemed us if we're saved. We're saved because God the Holy Spirit gave us life if we are saved. He hath. God hath. Of this man's seed, the seed of David, hath God raised unto us. A savior, But notice it says according to his promise. Of this man's seed hath God according to his promise. Now, God's promise is infinitely different than anybody else's promise. Why is that? Because I can make a promise and have every, every intention for that promise to take place and it can fail. I might even make a promise. I hate, I, I don't want to do this, but I might even make a promise that I know I can't keep. But not God. Not God. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that's exactly what's going to take place. All will come to repentance. Galatians 3, 18, for if the, inher if the inheritance be of the law, it's no more promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. And if you have, if I have salvation, it's because God promised our personal salvation through his son before the world began. Now the promise of God is eternal. Everything God does is eternal. The promises of God is eternal. The promise of God is immutable. That means 
It can't be changed. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. He's not going to change his mind. And the promise of God is efficacious. All the promises of God in him are yea. And amen. So be it. To the glory of God by us. Now God's promise is so sure. Listen to this. And then once again, language kind of fails here. But when God makes a promise, it becomes past tense before it's taken place. That is how supreme his promise is. That's why Christ is called the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That's part of God's promise. And that's in the perfect tense. And I love this. Before time began, they used the perfect tense, perfectly completed, never to be repeated. Well, did he have to come in time? Sure he did. But the will of God is so supreme in this that my salvation was accomplished before time began. Now, that means works are altogether excluded, doesn't it? Notice in our text, of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior. Who's Israel? Is this talking about national Israel? Is it talking about that little country in the Middle East? No. Israel is God's elect. Do you remember when the Lord Jesus said to that Syrophoenician woman, when she was asking for mercy, he said, I came not, I came not, but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And that's talking about every one of God's elect. That's who he came to save. I'm not sent, but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's precisely what he's referring to when he said. He's not, he's not talking about national Israel. He's talking about Israel. The Israel of God. The elect of God. I'm a Jew. You're a Jew. We are the circumcision. We're the true circumcision, which worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus and nowhere else, and have no confidence in the flesh. Now that is the true Israelite. It's not talking about that nation in the Middle East. That's talking about the true Jew. Listen to this scripture from Rome, or Acts chapter 5. Um, him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give Israel repentance and the remission of sins. Oh, the promises to Israel, all Israel, Romans eleven twenty six, all Israel shall be saved. Now, when Paul gives this definition of the gospel, Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, you have to ask the question, who's the hour? Israel, all of the elect, everybody for whom he died. Now somebody says, why make an issue of this? Because the Lord does. That's enough of a reason, isn't it? He said, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them whom thou hast given me. He said, I lay down my life for the sheep. The Lord made an issue of this. Now, if I believe that Christ can die for someone and they end up in hell anyway, now listen real carefully, this is how important this is. If I believe that Christ can die for somebody and make a payment for their sins and they end up in hell anyway, there are some who are not saved for whom he died then I believe that something I did is what makes the difference between me and that person who went to hell. I don't believe Christ made the difference. I believe I made the difference. And salvation is of man. Now, the issue is, did Christ make salvation available or did Christ save? And that's the kind of Savior I need. A Savior who saves. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. 
Who is he that condemns? It's Christ that died. Yea, rather that's risen again, who's even at the right hand of God. I can't be condemned. That's how my Savior saves. This is the hope of Israel. Now, I've already quoted the scripture, but somebody's wondering, well, am I a true Israelite? How can I know if I'm a true Israelite? Well, I've already uh, quoted the scripture. We are the circumcision. We're the true Jews. We're the true Israelites, which worship God in the spirit. Now, here's the first mark of a true Israelite. I know that the only way I can worship God is by the spirit of God. I can't worship him on my own. I can't do it only if I am supernaturally enabled by the Spirit of God to worship Him can I enter into this thing of worship. We are the circumcision, and I'm dead sure of that, which worship God in the Spirit. Secondly, we rejoice, glory, have confidence in Christ. Paul put it this way in Galatians 6, 14. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks who worship God in the Spirit rejoice only in Christ Jesus. They don't look to their works. They don't look to their evidences. They don't look to their experience. They look only to Christ. And let me tell you something, that everybody who worships God in the Spirit and rejoices in Christ Jesus also, they also have this. They have no confidence in the flesh. None. Zero. Nada. If my flesh has anything to do with salvation, I have no hope. I have no confidence at all in the flesh. Now that is the true Jew. That's the Israel that God has raised a Savior for. And notice this word of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior. He could not be a Savior unless he was raised. It doesn't say he made provision for a Savior. It says he raised a Savior, which is Jesus. My salvation is predicated on his resurrection. Now, I wish I could say this the way it ought to be said. Let me give it a shot. I'll just quote a scripture. He was delivered for our offenses. That's why I died. He was delivered for our offenses. My sin became his sin. He became guilty of that sin. But not only was he delivered from our offenses, he was raised again for our justification. You see, when Christ died, he never went through the process of decay. I don't know what was going on during that three days, but I know his body wasn't decaying because he rendered complete satisfaction to God. God, when Christ died, God said concerning Todd Nybert and everybody he died for, I am satisfied with them. God is satisfied with me. And all my salvation is dependent upon his resurrection. When he was raised from the dead, God said, I am infinitely satisfied. I'm infinitely pleased. That's all my salvation. His resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 4 said he was raised from the dead according to the scriptures. 2 Timothy 2, 8 says, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of the David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Romans 10, 9, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now understand this. That doesn't mean simply that you believe in the fact of the resurrection. I guarantee you, if you went out in the street and asked most people in Lexington, Kentucky, now there'd be some that'd say, no, I don't believe in that, but most people would say, yes, I believe Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Um, it's not just talking about believing the fact of the resurrection. 
It means all your salvation is in his resurrection. That's it. You are relying on his resurrection. You believe in your heart. You believe with your understanding. You're glad it's this way. You, you understand. God raised him from the dead. And that is my hope. My hope is all in his resurrection. That's what is the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The only thing that satisfies my conscience, only thing, now listen to me, I'm telling you, this is the only thing that satisfies my conscience, the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Nothing else. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Huh. You believe you were sent by the Father? You believe that he's the son of God, that he came in the flesh, and he did what he came to do. He lived for his people, he died for his people, and he was raised for his people. He was raised. I love to think of the angel saying, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He's not here. Boy, there's, that's, there's a lot in that question, isn't there? Why do you seek him who lives among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. A Savior wouldn't do me any good that's not raised. He is raised. And notice how it says in verse 23 of this man's seed, Hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. Which is Christ Jesus the Lord. Now understand this. He can't be Savior unless he's first Lord. He can't do anything for you unless he's Lord. God hath made this same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, a real simple way of understanding the Lordship of Christ is the Lord is the one whose will is done. That, that answers it. The Lord is the one whose will is done. His will was done in creation when he spake the world into existence. His will has been, is being done in providence yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Everything that takes place. You can't get away from that. Everything that takes place is his will being done. I like what Scott Richards once said. I don't want to stand on an inch of ground where it's not his will being done. I'd be afraid to stand there. He is an absolute, he's the Lord of providence and most especially he's the Lord of salvation. If you're saved, that means he himself willed your salvation. Our Savior is the Lord. Able to save because of his lordship. Turn with me for a moment to 1 Timothy 1. First Timothy 1. Verse 15. This is a faithful saying. This is something that is utterly reliable. Now, it's, the word saying is the word logos. It's the word that's generally translated word. But I love the way it's translated by our translators as a saying. It's as if this had reached the status of a saying in the early church. This is something that was said quite often. This was a saying. I mean, if you were around Christians, you were going to hear this statement very often, very repetitively. It was a saying. This is a faithful saying, and it's worthy of all acceptation. Now, somebody says, you, you preach a whole lot about Christ only dying for the elect and you preach a lot about you know, Christ only coming for particular people. What's this all about? 
I like it, don't you? You know what it's saying? This is worthy for you to receive. No qualifications. No qualifications. This is worthy for everybody to receive. This is worthy for you to receive, to embrace, to, to, to lay hold of and to rejoice in. This is worthy of all acceptation. I, I've, I've had people, I don't know how many times over the years, say, how can, you, how can you preach the gospel sincerely to all men if Christ only died for the elect? I don't have any problem with it at all. I don't know why anybody says saying anything like that. I mean, this is a faithful saying. This is what everybody ought to receive this. Now, look what it says. That Christ Jesus... Christ is his offices, as prophet, priest, and king. Christ, God's prophet, the very word of God who brings the word of God to us. God's priest, not a human priest only who brings the blood of an animal sacrifice, but the one who brings his own blood. God's king, yet have I set my king on my holy hill of Zion, the one whose will is done. But not only Christ, Jesus. Don't you love his name? We love to sing of Christ our King and hail him blessed Jesus. For there's no word ear ever heard so dear, so sweet as Jesus. You see, his name means Savior. It's the same as the Old Testament word Joshua, Moses, I, I you reckon Moses was disappointed that he can't, couldn't go into the promised land? I guarantee you he was. I mean, the Lord said, nope, you're not going. You're not going. And the reason he didn't go is because he failed to sanctify the Lord before the people. He smote the rock, the, the rock twice. The rock had already been smitten. He stepped on that great type of the gospel, because God has said, speak to the rock and water will come out. But no, Moses said, must we bring water out of the rock? All he's doing at that time was glorifying himself. He's a man just like me or you. And he smote the rock twice. And God in his mercy let the water come out. But the Lord said, you're not bringing them in. Well, the Lord purposed that to let us know, Moses, the law, can never bring us into heaven. Your works, the things you do, your works of obedience can never bring you into heaven. Who brought him into heaven? Joshua, the Hebrew name for Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world. He left his father's presence. He left the worship of angels. He left heaven. And he came into the world. Now what did he come into the world to do? What if it said he came into the world to save elect sinners? Would that be true? Absolutely. But you know what? If that's what it said... I wouldn't find any comfort in it. Not a bit. What if it said Christ came into the world to save repentant sinners? Be true, wouldn't it? But would you get any comfort out of that? What if it said Christ came into the world to save believing sinners? You might agree with that. But you might not be able to enter in and get comfort from that. The Puritans used to use this statement. Christ came to save sensible sinners. Well, that's the most stupid thing I've ever heard. Sinners are stupid by what they are. Uh, he didn't come to save sensible sinners. He came to save what? Sinners. Now, I can put myself in that group right now. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Not folks who used to be sinners. Well, I used to be a sinner, but I'm saved. 
just right now, can you put yourself in that demographic? And let me remind you what a sinner is. A sinner is somebody who is full of sin. That's what Peter said, depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. You don't want to have anything to do with me. All there is in me is sin. A sinner is somebody who all they are is sin. All they do is sin. They, they really, I mean, if you're a sinner, you don't feel like you can sit in judgment on anybody for anything. You know you can't. And you know that every time you do, which is plenty, it's pure hypocrisy. You know, I, I don't know how to, Paul said, let's not judge one another anymore. I say amen to that, and I'm judging somebody within five seconds. Um, that's what sinners do. They're still sinners. That's why they do things like that. It's not right, but thank God Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I'm one of them as sure as I'm a foot and a half high. I'm one of them. I can conclude he came to save me. And he didn't try to do anything. When he said, it is finished, I was saved. What a Savior. Let's pray. Lord, how we thank you for our Savior your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And how we thank you that he paid it all, all the debt we owe. How we thank you that he's a successful Savior, that he's an almighty Savior, that he's a merciful and gracious Savior. And Lord, we are so thankful that thy blessed son who you delight in who you're well pleased with where all your love is your son is our savior and Lord truly we rely on him only in his name we pray Amen